Okay, so very good evening and welcome to another lesson on classical physics, which we are continuing. Uh, already got a comment from Richard Loling that I need to finish an email writing to Shaunak. I have some questions, but they're too advanced for the current talks and I don't want. Yeah, so Richard, what you can do is that if you think that that is so nice of you, if you really think that there are certain things that you want from me, we can schedule a WhatsApp call or something and you can, you're all welcome to write an email to me and I will definitely like to answer those advanced topics over email. Uh, currently, what I will do for this particular lesson of today is that we have done with the, uh, you know, what is called a classical physics, determinism, uh, irreversibility, and what is called a state, uh, I mean to say a classical state, etc. Although I'm working on a new video on quantum state. So what I will going to do is that I'm going to start off with uh, something which is called coordinate system and which is again very central to any discussion. But I can tell you this much that this coordinates which I will be talking today will have some aspect of relativity also. I mean to say particularly special theory of relativity. General theory as you understand again is quite uh, diverse and quite complex. So I would be taking up general relativity in a separate class. So just to start, I will do with the coordinates. And from coordinates, there are certain things I would like to discuss. Email is probably uh, best logistic. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Richard. You are all welcome. So uh, in case of a coordinate system, first of all, what I would like to talk is that in order to describe any point, for example, quantitatively, and I've got a, a nice surprise also for all of you, we need uh, what is called is a coordinate system. So what we can see from here is that Rajkumar Mukherjee. Yes, very good evening. Rajkumar, welcome. So to describe points quantitatively, uh, we need to have a coordinate system. And uh, constructing a coordinate system begins with choosing a point on a space to the origin. So for example, if we consider our this solar system, right? So we would require a very much, uh, I would say, more complicated way to put the origin anywhere and then we can take up one location, but whatever it is, the origin, it can be arbitrary, but we can keep to that choice. Okay. So from here, we see that the, after we have selected a coordinate, the next step is to choose the three perpendicular axis. Again, the location is somewhat arbitrary as long as they're, uh, you know, uh, perpendicular. That means what? That this, this selection of the origin can be anywhere as far as the Cartesian coordinate is concerned because we are dealing with classical physics. Whatever the position that you select, it can be anywhere. But remember that you have to stick to that uh, place. So in order to do and have a better understanding, I would like to you know share the Jamboard, which is uh, fairly simple this time. And here you can see that this is actually what is called the coordinates. I hope this is, uh, you know, clear and visible to you. So these are called the, uh, you know, X, Y, Z, these are the coordinates. Now this can be talked as I would say, even X1, I can talk it as Y1 and Z1. I mean to say this can be either way, but for the convenience, I am just uh, making it as X, Y, and Z. Now, in order to describe a point, obviously uh, I mean to say, what will I do with X, Y, and Z? For that, I need a point. So in order to have a point, we what we do is that we will take this point. For example, I will draw a particular point over here. And this is the point. And I call this point as P. Okay. So we call this point as P. And it can be located by given X, Y, Z coordinate of the point. So in other words, what we can say, we identify the point P with the ordered triple. So if this is the point, whatever the lines that I am drawing from here, or from this this part of in order to make a triangle or even if i'm drawing from this part this would give us the coordinate so we don't draw a you know point p in order to denote i mean to say uh, to identify the point from where it is happening now for now in case that now this is what is called the cartesian cartesian space so the x coordinate represents the perpendicular distance at p this one this is the perpendicular distance over here. And if I set x equals to 0, so if I set x equals to, say, for example, 0, then what I get is something, this kind of a thing. Well, we'll make it a little bit bigger. 
so in this kind of a system what happens is that this is a plane right so if we set x equal to 0 uh, then what we get is the distance of the p from the plane is defined so this is the distance so if i make this as a plane so this is the distance from p but the point here remains the same but instead of that i am drawing a kind of a plane okay so because the coordinates represents distance they are measured the distance is measured in terms of units length as meters, whatever, kilometers, etc. So here it is. Because the coordinate represent distances, they are measured in terms of units of length, such as meters, etc. And this is, I mean to say, this is fairly simple. You might be thinking that this is a school-level coordinate geometry uh, that actually I'm teaching. Yes, that is true, but we will soon explore further things to, uh, you know, show you. Okay. So from here, what we do is that we go, go into what is called time as a coordinate system. But, uh, okay, so uh, let me add over here. Yeah. So from here, why we are going into time as a coordinate system? Because in order to, when we are studying classical physics, we are studying motion. And in order to study motion, we also need to keep the track of time. I mean to say how the motion is evolving. So if I take time as a coordinate, then the first thing is what I would like to tell is a little bit story about how the coordinate system has been discovered. And for that, just give me a second. Yeah, for that, we have to go back to uh, the history of coordinate geometry. And I would like to talk of this uh, person. In general, people pronounce it as René Descartes. Uh, but the original French pronunciation is René Descartes. So it is written as René, but we actually pronounce it as Rune Descartes. Now, Descartes actually made a huge number of contribution in terms of science, mathematics, philosophy. Although coordinate systems were introduced in high school, I found they have a depth yeah, that continues to grow even in postgraduate. Yeah. So uh, one is Rune Descartes. Another person I have not mentioned, I should have mentioned, is also called Pierre de Firma. F-E-R-M-A-T, we call it as Fer Fermat's Last Theorem, but it is Pierre de Firma. Firma also developed the coordinate system very independently. Now, I would like to show you something which I told you, that this is one book. I don't know whether you can see it is not. This is called The Clockwork Universe. It was just there on my shelf, so I just thought to show you. And this is written by Edward Dolnick. And this is basically a wonderful history on the, uh, basically of Isaac Newton's, you can see this. Okay, Edward Donlinks, it is basically the birth of Isaac Newton's thoughts, ideas, etc. But it contains a huge amount of, uh, you know, content in terms of the development of classical physics. I would like to show you this one. Uh, as you can see, part one, London, then the uh, Saturn's Clause, etc. So it's a quite a dense book around, say, how many pages? I would say 355 pages. And part two also contains this, all this, uh, you know. And this contains a lot of good illustrations also, starting first with, uh, you know, Isaac Newton and then going back to all those illustrations. You can see this. And further it contains, it is a good book. I mean to say, if you really want to read it, you can purchase it. I purchased long back from Amazon. So it is really a wonderful book. It contains a lot about the development of classical mechanics, the social economic terms, the fight, the thought, the political upheavals, etc. And these are actually all those demonstrations which has got. And this is the back part of the book, as you can see here. It's quite a, you know, good, uh, dense book. It's a clockwork universe. Now, why I'm showing in, in this book is that this book actually shows you uh, a kind of, a, I would say, history on the development of what is called a Cartesian coordinate. Yeah, it looks really interesting. And the history tells what is that Rune Descartes one day was sleeping. And, you know, Descartes was actually a very frail fellow. Uh, he really did not have that strength and the queen was calling to go to the war and etc. So he was basically um, health wise, he was never very strong. So he used to sleep uh, almost 9, 10, 11 hours in a day. 
So you might have a question that then how he can do all those mathematics and philosophy. Anyway, that is different. And there is another book, uh, which is, I think, right, I will show you another day I have to pick up from the shelf that is called uh, Meditations on the First Philosophy, Meditations on the Second Philosophy. That is basically on the idea that cogito, cogito ergo sum, how this came. Uh, in this particular book, what it, what it tells is this one, that he was actually lying on the bed and recommends advanced books on classical mechanics. Advanced books on classical mechanics, Sartak, I will tell you. Uh, just hold on because I am into something. Definitely you can contact me later in my WhatsApp. I will tell you what are the advanced books. Or you can just wait. I will just look into my uh, hard disk. Uh, I mean, into some of my system and I will tell. I think I have got some books over here also. So, and he was lying and looking upwards and there was a, a fly which was moving up, down on the wall, etc. And the story says that uh, Descartes was actually trying to measure that how he can locate that fly. Right. So, if the fly is moving in this direction, then he thought that if I move uh, this way to X and this was towards Y, then I can precisely find out. And this book, I tried to, you know, after I came back from my college, I tried to find out that where actually the history has been. I didn't get the time because it's already 9.15, but I will try to find out and read out those lines. But anyway, the history is history. It always. So from here, he actually find out this quadrant system. So that is how, and prior to that, it was the Greek philosophers and the Greeks and Indians who were trying to measure, uh, I mean to say, a coordinate system in a different way. But the history is that, that is how that, that, that fly made all the difference that small fly and uh, we, uh, he actually tried to locate that and he found what is called the uh, coordinate system. So uh, the thing is that when we study motion, obviously we have to keep uh, uh, track of the time and the usual convention is that positive times are to the future of the origin and negative times are to the past, right? But the thing is that the location of the origin again is arbitrary, put it anywhere, but once it is chosen, uh, the stick with the choice and we could pick the uh, you know anything like big bang etc uh, sorry um, uh, big bang etc the birth of jesus or just could start an experiment i mean to say we can do anything that we actually start with time so now one thing uh, what i would like to mention here which is very very important is that if you to ask me that in which direction time flows then usually the convention is that positive times are towards the future and the negative time are towards the past. Now you might ask a question that why don't we reverse it? That could, could we could do it, but that would again require a different quadrant. But however, for the sake of today's class, I am not going to do that. So I will take the positive as a future and the negative as the past. Now, in while I am trying to define time, because we are going to talk a little bit more about time in terms of classical physics as well as in terms of relativistic physics, what I would like to first tell you is that there are basic two implicit assumptions. That means implicitly I assume that about time there are two things. First of all, time runs uniformly. Again, when we are talking of the implicit definition, what I am trying to tell is that uh, this is again Newtonian mechanics or classical physics that we are talking. So one is that time runs uniformly and time can be compared at different locations. I will just try to give you an idea of what actually it is. Now here you see when, when I say that time runs uniformly, what I am trying to mean is this, that uh, if, for example, if I get the, uh, you know, uh, I, I take an experiment that the number of seconds for a weight or anything like a cannonball which Galileo actually uh, experimented from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. So uh, the, num the number of seconds that the weight or the cannonball will be required to fall, fall from the Tower of Pisa in Galileo's time as it takes in our time also. So one second meant the same thing that happened then and as it happens now. Yeah, Rahat. Uh, Walaikum Salam. So uh, that, is, that is very important. So time as a coordinate, the first implicit idea is that time runs uniformly. That means the, the concept of a second, the concept of a minute, whatever, when Galileo experimented, it is the same which I am experimenting right now of a second when, when it is falling. This is very important. The second thing is that the time can be compared at different locations. 
Now, when I say that the time can be compared to different location, this means that the clocks located in different places can be synchronized. And this can be given, for example, when we take up another coordinate, which I would like to show you here, is that if we take x, y, z, and say, for example, we take t. Okay, so this is basically what I'm trying to give you over here. So if I take a function, I've need not written the function. Okay, say, let me write this function over here. So if I write this function, say, for example, f of t, I think I have improved my handwriting and the mouse work, isn't it? What do you feel? Earlier, I used to write uh, <laughs> much bad handwriting. So f of t is equal to t squared. Then we can plot the points on a coordinate system. And we will use, we are, what we are doing is that we are using the axis uh, time t over here just for the tire sake of our discussion, and another function ft over here. And currently what I am doing is that I am just mentioning these dots. I mean to say, say for example, these are just dots over there uh, in order to plot this function. And we can also connect the dots the, the way I have done. I have also connected the dots and I have made a kind of a curved line. So this is, I, I mean to say, what I'm just trying to tell that given a kind of a function, we can plot that function over it, and then we can start using or plotting or finding out time, etc. Now, from this, what we can, oh, okay, uh, so sorry. So from this, we will move on to the next important part, very important part of our discussion, is that what are the different times, different types of time, I would say, what are the different types of time that are used in classical physics? Okay, just give me a second. Uh, I will just, because this is too uh, small, I will just open up the yeah classical physics. So I hope you are all enjoying this, today's class. Any reactions, Can you can put it up. Uh, just a second. So where is my live lecture, live sessions, 2024? Classical physics and today's 18 year. Right. Okay. So time, different types of time. And what I would like to tell now is that I am trying to now move out time as a notion in not in only in terms of classical physics, but I'm taking a little bit of special theory of relativity also. Now you might ask me that, sir, you are teaching classical physics while you are going into relativity. But let us not forget that relativity is also very much classical, isn't it? So the concept, uh, what comes is that in order to understand time as a whole, and because time has uh, undergone a massive change uh, so during the time of Isaac Newton, Descartes, Leibniz, um, all those, and the time that we deal, so it is better that we can have a, please, sir, sir say something about semi-classical mechanics. Yeah, ft, bar t, uh, ft equals to t square should be a parabola graph, yes. But I mean to say, I you are absolutely like Muhammad Bilal. But in order to make the discussion very simple, I've just taken that kind of a uh, graph just to make you understand about semi-classical mechanics. Okay, I will talk about that. Just give me some time because, as I told you, if you ask questions, it will be uh, difficult because otherwise, whatever the target I have today, I won't be able to cover. So first of all, I would talk about what is called a coordinate time. Now again, this is very important in order to understand classical physics and those who will be moving into special relativity. So in general, when we talk about coordinate time, it is basically the time in general. So for example, now it is 9.35 on my clock, on your clock, whatever. So coordinate time is basically the time assigned to an event by an observer at rest relative to a coordinate system. It is essentially the time that would be measured by distant observer as a uh, synchronized set of clocks. That means we can say that classical physics or Newtonian physics, etc., uh, is actually something uh, uh, is uh, which takes the coordinate time, uh, you know, uh, into account. So, uh, if you take off the general time that is being discussed, so that would be a cardinal coordinate sign. Okay, what Muhammad Bilal right now told me, I would like to also uh, do a little bit of correction onto that also, and he has been right. So in order to do ft equal to t square, okay, let me go back here. It should actually be coming like this. So Mohammed, if you can correct me. So if I take this kind of a line, uh, it would actually, uh, uh, okay, let me draw this one. 
and it would be actually this. It would go like this. Isn't it? Parabola? Mohammed, if you are watching, do let me know now. Are you feeling happy or not? <laughs> okay. So this should be the uh, actually the parable. And he has pointed me right. So I just tried to, you know, uh, make a kind of a basic understanding. But technically, yes, this would be Ft equals to T square. F of T equals to T square. So Mohammed, if you're watching, I think now you feel happy that I have actually made the corrections. Okay. So coordinate time, what we are talking is basically denoted by the letter T, Latin letter T. And this relationship between coordinate time and proper time is given by Lorentz transformation, which I will come later. Now, let us see that this one. So in case that we are dealing with a coordinate time, and if the space-time graph is a kind of a curve, so we can say whatever it is curved or let it be Cartesian flat. So each grid, I mean to say, I'm trying to give you an understanding that this is a massive grid spread over across our universe. And each point of the grid has a coordinate. It can be space, time, whatever. But it includes one for time. So let us imagine that it is a vast grid and which is stretching, stretching massive across the universe. And each point of it is actually mentioned by the time. So this is the coordinate time. We can say a universal numbering for events. And it is like the sheet of a music for orchestra telling everyone that they, when there comes in part. So this is what is called the coordinate time. Another type of time which we have got, which relativity actually takes care, is called the proper time. And proper time is actually denoted by this Greek letter tau. So proper time is a time experienced by an observer who is moving along the clock, right? And it is the measure by a clock when it is at rest relative to. So you, you see, then these concepts of events and uh, uh, what you call world line, etc., the space-time cone, etc., comes into play. So when we talk of the general time, what is the time? See, for example, I ask Rajkumar, anybody, so what is the time? We, it generally means coordinate time. That means specific to what is to your coordinate, that is the time it is denoted by T. When relativistic things comes into effect, my time compared to another, and we are doing all those uh, relativistic uh, transformation, that is done. And this is, you can see, is the Lorentz transformation factor. So the, when we talk of the uh, you know, twin paradox, etc., we are all taking what is called the, uh, uh, the proper time. So here is an example which I have taken. Say, for example, there is an observer in 0, 0, 0. Now, why 0, 0, 0? Uh, uh, the three axis of space and one axis of time. We will talk later in another lecture why space time was united by Einstein, which was not there by Isaac Newton. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about attoseconds and zeptoseconds in the next lecture. But right now, let us understand that there is a coordinate 0, 0, 0, 0 and 10 years comma. So, so this means that an observer A. So, uh, OK, let me quickly share the jambo so that this again uh, becomes a, a, you know, a little bit clear for you. So I won't draw the entire uh, mathematics, but what I'm going to do is that I'm just going to, you know, take uh, one coordinate so that it is kind of a visualization which comes. So here we are, here it is. So this would be 0, 0, 0, 0, comma, 0, comma, 0. And this is basically the time, the proper time, but I should not mention it as this one. I should mention it as this, that is the tau. And here is an observer, for example, if I take this observer A, and this particular observer is moving fr from 0, 0, 0 to some value from here to here, and then again coming back from here to here, and this is how it goes on. I will say just to give you a kind of a basic understanding of how things are. Okay, so if I take this one, you see that what happens typically is that uh, I would assume that uh, that person moves from... 0, 0, 0 to 10 years. That means uh, A stays at X equal to Y equal to Z equals to 0 for 10 years. And then the proper time interval is, uh, as per the Lorentz transformation, 10 years square, square root of 10 years square, which will be again 10 years. So being at rest, rest in special relativity coordinate system means that the proper time and coordinate time are the same. This is what we understood in terms of relativity. But it won't be when things starts moving. Now, here you see in the next slide, what I'm trying to show you is that another observer B, so again, from the same origin, 0, 0, 0, for five years, 
up to certain 4.33 light years, just a kind of a hypothetical number. If it goes, then B accelerates and travels into another spatial direction for another five years. So what happens is that delta tau uh, will become five years minus 4.33 years. These are just the coordinates, which will be equal to 6.25 years squared, which will be equal to 2.5 years. So what would be the total proper time? Obviously, this minus this. So we get this as total as five, five years. Now, here you see this is five years. And here you see this is 10 years. So that means obviously there has been a time dilation. So I'm not going into the mathematics very precisely. But this is just to show you that why time dilation and the proper time and coordinate time takes the difference. There is another thing which is called gravitational time dilation. I mean, so this doesn't come under what is called time, but this is gravitational time dilation. So because gravity also bends the space time affecting the tempo of time itself. So stronger the gravity, the slower the clock. I, I mean, to say this is quite clear. And there is another thing which is called relative simultaneity. Now, when we talk of relative simultaneity, what I'm trying to show is a figure like this. Okay, let me make it a little bit bigger so that I can make you understand. So here is the lightning which is happening. And this is one observer which is standing A. And this is the observer which is B. And standing at the position this one at 1. And standing at the position as this one as 2. Now what happens is that these two observers 1 and 2 both stand on a large platform. And there are lightning strikes from A and B. Now, the observer who is at 1, you see, you can see the observer 1, this one. He is located more or less at the midpoint. The observer is located at the midpoint of the spatial coordinates. So, uh, light signals coming from the uh, strikes A and B arrive at the observer 1 first. So, from A to B, if the lightning is coming, he will notice it first because he is standing at the midpoint. Now, the observer 2, this observer... Okay, the observer 2 is located much closer to the strike of A, right? It is much closer. Here it is much closer. But here it is much more distant. So observer 2 is standing at a much closer uh, to the strike A. As a result, the light signal from strike A arrives to the observer 2. That means this will come much, much faster because, because he is standing closer than the light signal from B because B is far, far off, right? And observer 1 sees the signal at the same time. Observer 2 sees them at different times. Observer 1 sees the signal at the same time. Because this one is standing midway between this one this, and this one. Right? And what happens for the observer 2? The observer 2 actually, uh, you know, sees uh, the location. Uh, uh, observer C sees them at different times. First this, that this. So what does this mean? Okay. So this one is coming closer. This one is later. He sees the first and he sees at different times. So what we can see from here typically is that, okay, I will come to this uh, next part, is that the relative uh, relativity of simultaneity is a consequence of the Lorentz transformation. And what it says that there is nothing called universal now that applies to all observers. That means, say, for example, I and you see something right now because things happen on a relativity, and that is called relative relative simultaneity, so that the concept abolished by Albert Einstein was that there is nothing called now that applies to observers. What is considered simultaneous depends on all the observers relative to motion. Now here you see at 1 hour 12 minutes and time at 1 hour 12 minutes, a car crash takes place, hypothetically, God forbid it never happens. <laughs> and this person on Earth, can see both of them at the same time. But a person who is located on the airplane, obviously will see it something much, much later. Or maybe see this one, the plane crash at New York first and then at London. So that is the basic idea of the difference. So who is on earth? So obviously between New York and London, there is a huge difference. But the basic idea is that if a person sees this and this, sees at the same time, but somebody on the airplane, and that is why it is called relativistic simultaneity. So first we learned about what is called the coordinate time, and this is the general time that we talk about. Then we learned about proper time, 
which is actually the time which relativity takes into account the Lorentz transformation, the time dilation, the twin paradox, etc. And this is how it shows mathematically what is time dilation. We also found gravitational time dilation, as you see, astronauts on ISS, International Space Station, looks things a little bit slower. And this is uh, also called relativistic simultaneity, where I try to explain with this and the other one, which is the uh, lightning striking here and here, and they see it at relative speed at each other. So that is all for today's video. Again, a very good uh, recommendation if you can go ahead and look into the Clockwork Universe by Edward Dolnick. I, I read this book and I love this smell. It makes me very nostalgic to those days when I have purchased it. So it was written in Fibim.com. I don't know whether this website still exists or not. My name is written and this is me 2013, almost 10 years back. Right, so this is my name and it is written, it is infibeam.com. And I remember Infibeam used to give uh, books at a very cheap rate. I don't know whether it still exists or not. Me and one of my friend used to purchase a lot on infibeam.com. So no, this is not because now it is showing Infibeam Avenues, a fintech company. Oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you, Richard. Thank you, everybody. So next class coming up very soon would be on the different measurements of time and there we will look into the recent discoveries of attoseconds the nobel prize winner and how we can measure time so the agenda would be once we cover up the concept of time then we will be covering up trigonometry a little bit not much pi radi pies and radians etc and then we will go to vectors and from vectors, we will be directly moving into motion. And this motion motion would be including a little bit of differential calculus. Now, again, I would assume that you know the basics of differential calculus. Because to be very honest with the other channel of general relativity, I really don't have any plan to teach calculus right from the beginning. But maybe in near future, if people want, I can do that. So I have already made one video of the last four classes in a very detailed manner called 52 minutes video, which is called the nature of classical physics. It is there on my channel. I posted on Sunday and it's going good touch foot till now. And you can look that if you have missed all my classical physics lecture prior to this one, everything is now condensed in a form of the nature of classical physics. And I have tried to explain each and everything. Thank you very much. I will soon announce the next date and we will talk about time, uh, the measurement of time, the units of time. And from there, we will move a little bit into trigonometry and quickly into vectors and then into the physics of motion. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, Muhammad Bilal. Thank you, Rajkumar. And those who are watching, thank you very much. Please do share my video because people consider this to be a live class. So not much people are viewing because there are a lot of other talks and interventions and answering your question. I won't say intervention, answering your question. So uh, you can share this as a complete video. Okay, Rajkumar Chatterjee, you asked, no, somebody asked me about uh, books on classical mechanics, advanced books on classical mechanics. So Sarthak, please get in touch with me over WhatsApp. I will mention you the names, give you the screenshots. And if I have the uh, downloadable links also, Sarthak, I'm going to send you so that you don't have to purchase anything and you can just uh, uh, download and read. One good news coming up in this Calcutta Book Fair, there are a few young people who has floated a magazine. And in that magazine, one of my paper, one of my essay is published, which is called The Saint of Mathematics on the Life and Works of Gregory Perelman. So once I get this soft copy, I mean to say the hard copy, they send it by my post. I will definitely share in the community box and you can also purchase that small magazine. I have just, uh, they've requested, so I just thought to, and it's a, you know, kind of small writing. It's called the Saint of Mathematics. Thank you very much. Keep healthy and we will be back soon with a few more videos and lessons. Thank you.